I've been fascinated by thresholds for a very long time. I used to look at trees and wonder how many leaves had to start changing colors for me to notice that summer had gone and fall had begun. I'd stare at planes in the sky and ask myself when they would become so small that I would stop seeing them. I'd ask myself at what point red started becoming orange or light became dark. I found it fascinating because thresholds determine how we define things and how we define things determines how we view the world. When does right become wrong? When does positivity become toxic? And when does pleasure become pain? These questions continue to fascinate me, but I've recently moved from the existential and esoteric to the more practical. Thresholds are beginning to take on a new meaning for me. I'm beginning to realize that life is all about thresholds. It's all about the tiny and minuscule coming together imperceptibly at first to create noticeable change once they surpass some seemingly arbitrary threshold. We see this throughout all of life. Mere seconds passing add up to a life lived. Water droplets pooled create vast oceans. Minuscule atoms bond to form all of matter. Insignificant grains of sand amount to deserts. Tiny habits compound into momentous change, and small, kind gestures can turn into a lifelong friendship or partnership. Life is all about thresholds. But most people only seem to focus on the moment that change becomes noticeable. That used to be me too, but I'm now more interested in everything that leads up to that moment, and what usually goes unnoticed. The moment that change becomes noticeable shouldn't be considered the only one of significance. I recently listened to Atomic Habits by James Clear, and he chose to explain the same concept by using the following quote by social reformer Jacob Rees. When nothing seems to help, I go and look at a stonecutter hammering away at his rock, perhaps a hundred times without as much as a crack showing in it. Yet, at the hundred and first blow, it will split in two. And I know it was not that last blow that did it, but all that had gone before. Another application of this concept is the following. If a man has one dollar, he is not rich, but if he has one million dollars, then he is. The thing is, in order for him to ac accumulate one million dollars, he first has to acquire his first. At what point then does one dollar make a man rich? Clearly it's not when he's going from zero to one, but then is it when he's going from 99,999 to 100,000? or 849,999 to 850,000? What defines a rich person to you? We all set these goals based on arbitrary numbers. I want 100,000 subscribers. I want a million dollars. I want three cars in the garage. But what makes these numbers so special? Why choose to believe that success has only been achieved once these numbers have been reached, when to reach these numbers, every number before them has to matter too? The truth is, you can choose to view it like most other people and consider that the man is only rich once he has attained a certain amount of money. But you can also just as easily choose to view it as if the man was always rich, both when he had one dollar, one million dollars, and every moment in between. Because the fact is, in order for him to have gone from one dollar to one million dollars means he first had to believe that he was already rich. And that's really what makes someone rich. This is why you can and should choose to view, view yourself as successful every time you just show up too. Because it's those tiny moments of dedication that add up to your eventual, red, external success. And because, like in the last scenario, in order for you to consistently show up, you first have to believe that success is already yours. Time just hasn't caught up enough for it to be reflected in the external reality. In this way, I've come to think of the buildup almost as votes for what will eventually become manifest in the physical reality. Until something is manifest, it just exists in the field of potential. But there are infinite potentialities in this field. So what comes out of the theoretical and potential and into the tangible and manifest is what gets voted for most often. Majority wins. Like a seed that you water daily, even though it can take days and sometimes even weeks to emerge from beneath the soil as a seedling, trust that the work that you're putting in now will one day give rise to significant results. 
What you do now does in fact shift reality. It's just that we live in the matrix that's made up of both space and time. Time is a necessary ingredient of anything and everything manifest on this planet. For something to precipitate into the physical means that the universe has had the time to rearrange itself to reflect the majority vote, which is why there's usually a delay between your actions and their consequences. A few months ago, I watched a video made by a psychiatrist named Rafael Lopez, who teaches on the human condition through an educational model known as Semiologia de la Vida Cotidiana, or Semiosis of Everyday Life in English. His videos are usually full of food for thought and interesting and enlightening insights, advice, and explanations. But in this particular video, he said something that stuck with me since. He said that being born means being tasked with learning how to wait, because birth marks the transition from a realm of immediate gratification to one of delayed gratification. In the womb, our every thirst, hunger, need, and desire is immediately satiated through the umbilical cord. This all ends the moment we're born. In this world, we're made to wait. Even in order to take our first breath, we're made to wait, as our lungs are still full of amniotic fluid, which is why it's priority to make the infant cry following its birth. This trend continues throughout all of life. We have to eat dinner before we can have dessert. We have to finish our homework before we can watch TV. We have to be kids before we can be adults. We have to gain experience before we can get paid well. We have to work our entire lives before we can earn ourselves a few years of rest, and on and on and on. Life here is necessarily a life of waiting. Very few things come immediately or even quickly, and it's doubtful that those that do are any good for us, because like Frederick Bastiat noted, it almost always happens that when the immediate consequence is favorable, the later consequences are disastrous and vice versa. To me, this sounds an awful lot like the difference between heaven and earth. In heaven, our every desire is immediately met. On earth, we wait. But even more profoundly, I think that this comparison can also be made between heaven and hell, only with a little twist. Heaven and hell are the lives we make for ourselves here on earth. It all just depends on your perspective. If you realize that life on earth implies a life where there's a delay between everything you do and the results of your actions, between your dreams and desires and actually achieving them, and not only accept this, but use it to your advantage, then your life will be a heaven on earth. But if you choose to fight against this, if you choose to make yourself a victim, if you choose not to act now because you won't see the results right away, then your life will be hell. And this is true of any area of life, so much so that, it, at least to me, it seems almost like a law. Which to me means two things. Number one, there's order underneath all the chaos here on Earth and in the universe, implying that life isn't merely an accident, we're here for a reason. Number two, the reason we were put here on Earth to face all these trials and tribulations and hardship was to learn one thing how to trust in ourselves, in the universe, and in that everything will eventually work itself out. If you like this video, then you'll also want to check out the video that I'll link in the end card. It also touches on how to make your life a meaningful one. Before you leave though, comment down below letting me know what you do to prioritize the journey over the destination. I'd love for this to be a space where we could all share with each other, so I really look forward to reading what you guys have to say. Also, if you like this video, then hit that like button, and if you really liked it, then subscribe so you can catch all my videos as soon as I drop them. But as for right now, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.